Chapter 5 I thought the people with bodies might be a little cringy, but the ghost guy was more so. The All Flags Brigade was located about 500 kilohex east of the city. Leaving at daybreak on regular transport, Tuadon and Salmon could be in West Aslia by nightfall. They'd take rooms in an inn and leave for the West Marches in the morning. That journey would be on horseback. While they would stay with the All Flags Brigade once at their encampment, Selman and Tuadon would be in bedrolls for one night when they were at the midpoint between West Aslia and the AFB encampment. When the transport docked at the station, Tuadon picked up both his and Selman's bag. Tuadon was extremely athletic, and he was used to, despite being a bookish and bureaucratic type, playing the part of a pack mule. He could carry a tremendous amount of weight. He picked up both the bags on instinct and began to trot along speedily, only then realizing that there might be presumption in what he had just done. He turned around to look at Salmon, who appeared to be more than pleased to not have to carry the bag. He was surprised, perhaps, at the gesture, but pleased. Salmon, knowing West Aslia better, took the lead. My magazine will pay for the inn. For me, it's a business trip, said Salmon. Me too, said Tuadon. This is about making five I, you know, relevant, asked Salmon. It's more complicated than that, said Tuadon. But essentially, yes. Are you saying this isn't about my work? Is this a Salmon opening Tuadon's eyes thing? No, said Salmon, caught off guard. I'm just saying that you own your guild. I just work for Cantria today. So if the journal pays for the rooms tonight, it won't be your money or mine. Mm-hmm, said Tuadon, not convinced of the sincerity of what Salmon was saying. Shrugging through the impressive weight on his shoulders, Tuadon spotted their destination ahead and motioned to Salmon. The inn was surprisingly well lit and outfitted. It could have passed for one in the city, most likely it was because it catered to travellers from Ocasella. Tuadon and Salmon put their bags in their rooms, and Tuadon checked in with Kaylin and the girls with an immersion scroll. Tuadon wasn't sure what Salmon was doing during that time. He wondered if Salmon had anyone to check in with, and if he didn't, that made Tuadon strangely uncomfortable. Not quite sad, but almost. The honest truth was, though, Scully, Salmon wasn't thinking about that. He was happy having a friend with him on a research trip. Checking in with someone is not something Salmon does normally. Yes, I guess they are kind of like us. No, I meant collectively. I don't see one of us as being the Salmon and the other being the Tuadon in our relationship. It sounds like you do, though. Ah, oh, but you're not going to tell me. Okay. The beds don't seem great. I'm assuming mine and yours are the same. These places are pretty uniform, said Salmon, gently nudging the edge of his thin mattress with his sturdy hiking boot, waiting for something to come crawling from under the bedsheets. I didn't really check. One night in a subpar bed won't kill me said Tuadon, purposefully pulling out several travel items in a practiced order. The light elf looked less like a game developer and more like a soldier making camp for the night. Selman chuckled at the thought and sat down to unpack his own night bag. Yep, well, we'll be in bedrolls tomorrow night and then cots at the encampment. I just meant it'd be nice for us, especially you, to have a good bed before roughing it, said Selman. Tuadon wasn't sure if Salmon's two presumptions, the first that this wasn't a business trip for Tuadon, and the second that Tuadon was a complete novice at camping, were leaks or intentional pokes. He could have interrogated it like a mature adult, or he could poke back. Guessing you have a cheap bedroll. You're worried about the cold tomorrow? asked Tuadon, glancing over at the very new and unused bits of Salmon's camping kit. Why do you think that? asked Salmon, putting a protective hand on his freshly bought camping bag. 
as if defending the object's honor. Picking up a pen, Tuadon hastily scribbled down a few items he knew Salman didn't realize he was lacking. You bought serum at the station when we left. Last time I checked, that's for keeping a heat dome shield spell going after you fall asleep. Unless you're career switching and gonna show the brigade you're a pyro mage, Tuadon said, handing the note to Salman. We passed a local sporting goods store on our way here. Before we head out tomorrow, I highly recommend picking up those items. Salman snorted, looking down at the small paper before gesturing toward Tuadon, note in hand. An elf just busted my chops for using magic instead of buying a thicker bedroll. Salman paused, glancing downward before meeting Tuadon's eyes again. You know, we... Ah, uh, we're not doing man and elf stereotypes much justice here. Salman said, offering Tuadon a cameradic smile. They both laughed. I'll up my game on the heartiness. Tuadon raised his hand as if taking an oath. I'll be more prone to violent outbursts, Salman said, taking an overly dramatic bow. As soon as the light kissed the heavens, Salman and Tuadon were up and preparing for the most arduous part of their journey. Stopping briefly at the local store, Salman picked up the extra-thick socks Tuadon suggested, and a few other small objects that would purportedly bring Salman a dramatic sense of comfort on the trail. Baby wipes. Purchases complete, the pair set off. Tuadon assisting Salman in arranging his pack in such a way to minimize his mount's rate of exhaustion. And with these preparations, they ended up making a fair amount of ground and camped about where they had planned to on their map. Close to the main trail, they found a spot to tie off their horses for the evening. When something interesting caught Selman's eyes. Gently slapping Tuadon's arm, he pointed toward a smallish structure completely overtaken by the local flora. The two approached a gentle sense of youthful wonder electrifying the air between them. The structure appeared to be a ruin, and although neither of them had a particular background in history, they debated if the construction was from the Azrael Imperium's occupancy of the marches, or if it was a lost dwarven ruin. Hours later while camped out, after close inspection of their local map, they learned the ancient structure had been part of an Ocasellan Return to Nature outreach program that died out roughly 50 years ago. Their ancient imperial ruins were the remains of a community picnic area. The resulting embarrassment from this discovery struck them both silent for several minutes before they were able to laugh at their childlike absurdity. The following morning, as the site of the All Flags Brigade neared, they unmounted and walked their animals in by hand. A young human elf woman, whom they would shortly learn was Lieutenant Ankra Selt, came out to meet them with a younger elven man. He was clad not in the light plate armor of the brigade that Ankra wore, but simple blank plates lacking the intricate decoration of the higher rank. He followed close behind the lieutenant. I greet you in siblinghood. Ankra said with emphasis. Tuadon and Salman nodded. Both knew this meant that she was pleased to see a man and an elf in company of one another. And this in and of itself did not necessarily chafe at their values as Ocasellans. The values of her military unit, the All Flags Brigade, while it did not specifically exclude anyone, was mostly focused on incarnates, though there were a few revenants in the company. I am called the Unknown Revenant Entity, or the Lich Lord as adherents to the prophecy and goers of social boards call me. I've aroused suspicion in the residents of the marches. According to them, all indications were it was heading for the city and had been for the most part slowly, very slowly, ignoring everything else around it as it made its way there. I am not ignoring things. I take in my environment and appreciate little things. That report is not fair, Scully. I do not ignore you. 
The reason the AFB had taken this position here was suspicion. Suspicion by living incarnates of a powerful revenant. So, Selman wanted to ask the few revenants in the company, how do you feel about your outfit being stationed on a mission to guard against what could potentially be viewed as one of your own kind? The younger man who had come up with Lieutenant Selt took the reins of the horses. Lieutenant, said Tuadon. Ankra is fine, sibling, she said. Civilians can call us by our first names and we you. Unless it's your preference, we be more formal. Selman and Tuadon both noticed Ankra spoke in a manner that, at home, they would associate with older times. Odd word choices and such. No, of course, said Tuadon. I want to thank you and the Commander Mayroons for having us. We're very curious about how you and your unit are holding up here. Will we get a chance to thank the Commander in person? asked Selman. Yes, probably, Mr. Anne but I will be your liaison during the time you're here. No one commented on how Ankara had chosen to address Selman as Mr. Anne. Was it because he was with the press? Actually, Scully, Ankara fancied Tuadon a bit. And Selman, she very much did not. But that's neither here nor there. However, if you're anxious to get started, then one of our own scouts who has been going ahead and observing the unknown. He's ready to talk to you pretty much any time after he clocks out. You'll need to wait for his duty shift to be over, but that will be by half-light. Ankara bowed her head slightly, her eyes catching Tuadon's a fraction of a second longer than was socially necessary. Can I ask... Uh... Tuadon stammered, innately sensing that Ankara's interests were a little more than professional. He didn't have to turn to Selman to know the man found this interaction highly amusing. Ask anything, Tuadon. First names are okay, right? I'm a huge fan of Earth Game, by the way. Ankara betrayed the slightest bit of desperation in her voice. Really? Tuadon asked, petrified of where this conversation was heading and completely misreading the situation. Yes, I know. We do play games here in the marches, and most of us play EG or other fantasy titles. There's really no point to play warring states, is there? She laughed, her initial stoic demeanor completely evaporating. Not really an escape for us. Tuadon was so relieved to find that she was just a fan, he forgot his question, but found a new one. What do you play as? I'm a detective in London, trying to bring modern forensic methods to my work. My friends and I do our own campaign. We don't do the Jack the Ripper expansion. I hate Sherlock Holmes, by the way, she said. Tuadon followed, but Selman was confused. Firstly, Selman was more used to being around people who were more aware of his only partial familiarity with gaming. And thus, when Ankara spoke of her character as I, Selman wasn't sure where the character ended and Ankara began. It then needed to be explained that Sherlock Holmes was a fictional, fictional character. And John Haynes, Ankara's character, hated what to him was a poorly written fictional character, which he viewed as giving the public the wrong idea about his work. But Ankara herself liked the Sherlock Holmes stories. It seemed the law books mentioned several titles, and fans of Earth Game set out to actually write them as fan fiction. Not set in exactly the Earth of Earth Game, but in what was a dramatization therein. And although no one in the guild would say that these fan fictions were definitively what the characters would read, there was a certain amount of agreement among the fans that these stories were more or less accurate. To what one of the characters would read were they to go pick up a Sherlock Holmes novel. The exact exchange of all this involved a fair amount of over-explaining, even after Selman clearly got the meta-on-meta -meta aspect of what was being discussed. And it was now that Tuadon's original question, delayed by Ankara's more pleasant conversational interjection, found its way back to Tuadon's mind and tongue. When you said the unknown... By that you mean the unknown revenant entity. 
asked Tuadon. No, I mean the other unknown being marching its way through Hraith, having all the nations on edge, said Ankra. Without missing a beat, Tuadon continued. No one in your unit calls it the Lich Lord, Tuadon asked. No, it would be inaccurate, and thus could muddy our mission, and it could also be offensive. To whom? Salman asked. To the Revenant community, and potentially to the entity itself, said Ankra. Ankra doesn't even know me, and she's worried about offending me. I lovingly carry you around, and you stick ants in my food whenever you can, Scully. Ants in my food is too a saying. And even if it wasn't, do you expect me to believe you didn't get it? Both Salman and Tuadon failed to contain their shock at Ankara's, well, Arcaselan-ness. Some of us here believe in a world that you city folks are trying to build. Don't be so presumptuous. But if it's incarnate first sentiment you're looking for, don't worry, you'll get it. So, the scout. He, uh, it's he, right? Asked Salman. He, Ranger Dalian Airy, first class, Elven Ghost, highest ranking ethereal and revenant in the company, a fine officer, Ankara poked Tuadon with her elbow, Earth Game fan too, he'll want to talk about that, he already has ideas for 5i. I see, said Salman, how does he feel about what he saw? Ranger Airy will be off duty when you interview him, Mr. Anne, and thus he will be free to answer as a member of the company and give you his personal sentiment on anything he wishes. Tuadon was surprised to see that basically everyone slept in a tent, not much different than what he and his family would have used on a camping holiday. There didn't seem to be much separating anyone by rank. Each person at the encampment had a small modicum of privacy and this was to Tuadon's relief. He and Salmon would each be provided a small tent, equivalent to what everyone else had, for the duration of their stay. They put their belongings away and gathered with Ankara a short time thereafter at a larger tent, one of a few which seemed to be a gathering place for off-duty soldiers as well as a makeshift canteen. There was no food-serving area, but rather a series of prepared meals, all packed into small paper satchels with stasis spells on them. You break the sigil on the little string to end the stasis spell, whispered Ankara to both Salmon and Tuadon. Even if you're magically adept, just break the sigil. Don't negate the spell. A lot of the troops here are from the marches and other local areas, and unnecessary magic use can be seen as rude, said Tuadon. Yeah said Ankara. So, Ranger Avery, asked Salman, will he be joining us? I imagine, said Ankara, breaking her own package's sigil with her teeth in an unconsciously practiced manner. If you can just eat and wait a bit. Salman, I'd be interested to hear what he has to say as well, said Tuadon. That is if you don't mind me listening in. The clear implication was that Salman might want to interview Ranger Avery alone. Sure, said Salman. We are here for three days. I would hope to be able to talk to him more than once. Salman endured more chit-chat between Ankara and Tuadon. From the preview of Five Eye, it seemed Ankara was already planning her character for the next iteration. She wanted to play as a high-level member of the intelligence community. Focusing on cybersecurity for one of the major Western powers in the game. I think either America or France, she said. France is part of something called the EU in 5i, said Tuadon. European Union. It's not a single nation like America, but like a confederation. Is all of Europe in it? England? she asked. I don't remember. I know the writers were debating whether they were going to have Britain be a member or not. They spent too much time on that piece of the lore. They all have their opinions on how history should have unfolded. Salman endured another 15 minutes of made-up place names and fictional history 
when a ghost entered the tent who he presumed must be Ranger Airy. After some pleasantries, he took a seat. Selman took out a pad of paper. Met a paper or regular? asked Airy. It's regular. I would ask before I interviewed with Meta, said Selman. Very good, said Airy. So, Ranger Airy. Selman trailed off, deciding what tack he should take. Airy saw Selman's hesitation and took the lead on the conversation. You want to know what happened when I saw the unknown? Selman nodded. We're in this bit, Scully. Remember this? It was a fun night. Airy had been about ten days' journey from the current encampment. He was on the Shadow Coast, which I had been following for the last six days and he correctly deduced that I would turn inward. This was before the prognostic estimators had decided we were headed for Ocasella. They knew at that point, though, I would have to turn inward, or head toward the Mountains of Partiality, or else simply about face. Avery, being a ghost, was able to make his way to that spot quickly, and he waited under a tree in partial phantasmal torpor. He came out a few times when other travellers went by, and on one instance he saw a strong green glow moving slowly up the coastal path, illuminating the water on one side and the groins on the other. Yes, of course it was me. To him I was tall, ridiculously tall, about eight or nine feet, and wore ebony armour not traceable to any particular style. He described my helmet as a plain globe, but lich fire could be seen within it. Wouldn't you say, though, tastefully minimalist would be better than plain to describe my helmet? I think a few bits from his formal report will show that, although he was a lovely fellow, he really has a skewed view of me. The only thing not fitting with the moniker Lich Lord was its gait. Airy described me as walking in a style like an old man who swings his arms too consciously while on a walk to display he is walking for the health of his constitution. The listeners to this tale pictured something that embodied eldritch power and authority, and yet somehow too self-aware and awkward, as if worried about how it might be perceived by others far too much and holding itself into a performance to an unnatural degree. He is giving to Adon and Selman the idea that I am awkward. Hmm. And then, said Airy, it spoke. What did it sound like? asked Selman. Like a lecturer. Like someone giving you a lecture, but about history or art. Something you want to listen to, said Airy. But I mean, it sounded... Selman said, then trailed off and finished his thought by rolling his hands in a continued gesture. Like a lich. Like all liches who don't redo their voices to sound more incarnate. Like three women and two men speaking together with wind. Like that lich who voices the meta ads for those backpacks that are bigger on the inside. Like that guy. But imagine if that guy was trying to teach you something instead of sell you something. The backpack ad guy sounds like me, by the way. Not that I sound like him. And what did it say? Asked Tuadon. Selman shot Tuadon a dirty look for taking his question. It said, Wow, this wind is really something, huh? And I said, I guess. I'm a ghost, so I don't feel the wind. Avery said. Avery explained he muttered such a casual response because the very presence of my being hypnotized him. Here he was in the presence of something all the learned sentience believed must have slumbered since before recorded history. Back from the time the more religious called the Divine Age and the more modernist called Prehistory. And the surreality of that was layered and scaffolded with the surreality of me making small talk. Was it speaking common? Asked Salmon. Yep, said Avery. Modern common? Not even how we spoke it when I was a fleshy. I mean, I'm sorry, incarnate, Airy said. It was clear he apologised for the gaffe not because he regretted it, but because he thought it was what he was supposed to do. And did it say more? asked Salmon. 
Yeah, it said, oh yes, I don't feel the wind either. But I notice it, and it trailed off like it was embarrassed. Lost the volume in its voice, then gets its voice back and asks, Both of these paths, the upland road and the flat road, go to the marches, right? Is one a nicer walk than the other? And I said, I hear the upland is nicer. And it said thanks, and it took a step or two. Then it turned toward me and waved goodbye, kind of embarrassed like it should have waved earlier, when it said thanks, and I kind of waved back. And then? asked Salmon, furiously scratching down every detail. It kept on with that slow walk and that weird arm motion and took the upland path. And I waited until I couldn't see that green glow anymore. And I phased back here quick as I could and wrote up for the commander what I just told you. How did you... Salmon paused, looking up at the sky, hoping to find the right words. Feel as a revenant that this being is probably also a revenant. Mister, said Avery, I didn't feel anything like that. You don't notice who or what this thing is. You notice how it is. Could it be a ruse to appear non-threatening? asked Ankra. That's what the commander thinks, said Avery. Where did it learn modern common? asked Salmon. A high mage could learn it from the air, said Tuadon. My dad learned mech in two hours and he was only a level four adept. The conversation died slowly from there. Later, when Tuadon and Salmon were alone, they had a chat. So, what do you think it is? asked Tuadon. I don't know. We came here, I came here, to write about how people are reacting to it. But now I can't help but feel the object of my curiosity shift a little bit to what the unknown itself might be. Salmon paused for a moment and then continued. I guess this trip is a bust for you. Tuadon raised an eyebrow in suspicion. How so? He asked. It's just you wanted to see the situation of people outside Ocasella, or so I thought. And this doesn't seem like a typical situation. It's hard not to think about the unknown. No pun intended, but the lieutenant doesn't seem to have incarnationist-only views. But Ranger Avery, I was surprised that he used the term fleshy. He's a revenant in a military unit that excluded revenants until recently. He seemed pretty comfortable with referring to the living as fleshies. I kind of felt he was only correcting himself for us. Yet he seems perfectly comfortable working with his fellow soldiers. As if he is in a sense less conscious of the differences than us, said Salmon. Less conscious is not necessarily good, said Tuadon. It's not necessarily bad either, said Salmon. For the record, and I don't believe I need to point this out, Scully, but I knew what path went where. I am omniscient-ish. I was just being polite. And that guy said I was awkward to my soon-to-be friends. One game Nissal liked to play was to try to figure out what locations in Earth game corresponded with the real world. Ocasella, where the games were written, was influential on the major locations of the game. Her favorite parts of Ocasella were the Harmony District, the Advancement District, and the Creation Guild fields, with the public greens between them. It was in her portion of the city, or deep in the wilds, that she could imagine she was on Earth. Now, this was not a hard exercise if one is sitting in a forest, but in the city it was harder. Some parts of the fictional cities of Earth of Five Eye were described in minute detail, whereas others were less developed. St. Mark's in New York's Greenwich Village was basically Major's way in the harmony. London's East End was the reconciliation path in the Creation District, and University City in Philadelphia was the area around Tuadon's own guildhall where Earth Game was written. There was a particular block of the Harmony District where Nisul liked to sit on a bench in autumn, such that the sun would be behind her as she sat. The backlighting effect would let her see passers-by in silhouette, 
and so she could pretend their clothing was different if she wanted. The wood frame buildings on the block could belong in the East Village in New York. She could pretend Earth was real. However, this sense of immersion could be broken. A sound or an overheard conversation could shatter the illusion. Scully, I'm going to hold you with both hands for this part. The illusion wasn't always so easy to break. At university when she was playing 4i, Nisul had issues. She was underperforming in classes and the tensions with her parents first arose. It started as a nagging feeling. It was simply impossible to engage with the world without using some kind of magic any more than it was to go without breathing. She had become obsessed with trying to live purely causally. She had tried, but it was folly. She had a habit in college of walking around barefoot in public, just because it was so not a typical dark elf thing. And in the middle of a city, not the best idea. A cut on her foot became infected. She went to an apothecary to get a cream for it, but could find none that didn't have at least some magically activated botanicals in them. Eventually, when putting weight on that foot started to hurt, she used a healing spell. The truth was, one could not be sentient without some amount of magic flowing through one's very biology. Even mechs had magicka, and so did most animals. When the neurons of the brain fired, there was magicka present along with electropotential. Plants absorbed magicka from the sun. Magic, therefore, played a role in thinking and being. Which meant so did chance and unpredictability. This, in turn, meant that one could never fully control anything, even themselves. Why wouldn't it apply to you and I, Scully? I'll return to everything with Nisul and her university days shortly. But I want to know, why would you ask if chance and unpredictability apply to you and I? Do you think perhaps they do not? Scully fellow, I really wish you weren't silent now. I'd like to understand what motivated your question. But if you won't chat now, fine. I'll get back to the point I was making. Society had grappled with this question before. Some religions reconciled this by saying that one day a grand unified theory, which would rectify magicka theory and the causal laws, would show magicka was a special case of causal law. Yet there was no evidence of this, and great evidence to the contrary. She didn't believe in literal pure cause, but longed for it. So this left the option of literature and games. It had taken Nissel years to imagine why on Earth, where there was no magic, would one of the characters wish to seek it? Nissel thought maybe it was all those limits. Would it be worth the imposition of all the limits of a world without magic to gain predictability? All humans on Earth will die, and none will come back as ghosts. And there is no evidence of an other world for characters in the game. They believe in gods, but there is no evidence they were anything other than social and theological constructs. When rolling Owain for the Five Eye Pirate copy, Nissel toyed with the idea of giving it magic and breaking the law. But was this an imagining to exercise her own potential wish for pure cause? She was concerned. She had, of course, had that episode back with Four Eye. And in addition to this, wondered if in her escapism she was overlooking solutions to her problems that were possible even in the real world with magic. In the beginning of her final year studying archaeology at university, she had been given a new course of treatment. Potions and a spell set for her insomnia and depression. She knew, of course, there were side effects, and they did not always work right away. So, despite the fog, she continued with the course of treatment the healers put her on for a few weeks. Yes, I'm sure she felt alone. I don't need to scan reality for that. Being already in her thirties, not a late age for a dark elf to attend university, but still older than most of her cohort, she was given priority for a set of rooms on her own. 
to the deep-minded like Nassau, solitude is a double-edged sword. It could grant a break from the interference of others such that she could engage with the ocean tide of her mind when she wished. But there was no one to pull her back from such solitude, and its potential falls into the abyss of endless cycles. In this admixture of depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, and a cure that had a bit of kill in it, Nisul had an incident. She pulled the three-dimensional spectras from an immersion scroll of an object her four-eye character, Professor Ethan Rhys Davis, carried with him, a protractor, a symbol of Earth's pure, measurable causality. She used a conjuration lab to bring it into being, but, thought Nassau, maybe she had brought something purely causal to her world, and with it she could measure the cause within magic. It was nothing but a sculpture, yet she carried it with her for weeks in her bag. And when another student broke it, she started screaming how her one chance to break free had been taken from her. She was asked to discuss things with a university counsellor. And although she resisted, her secret came to light. In her own way, she had been flirting with the idea of pure cause and Earth being real in some sort of multiverse. It was not said she had a psychotic break or delusions, but an episode. So why did she consider giving her characters real magic? Perhaps if they had some reality, then they would grant pure cause to her. Lots of people with problems, real or emotional, worse than hers, had solved them in a magico-causal world. If she needed an imaginary artifact from a fictional reality to see solutions to her problems, what did it mean in terms of her shortcomings? One night, not long after the discussion with the counsellor and managing to convince everyone that she was okay, she performed a near-death spell. These spells were done by gurus at some churches, but usually by people in very peak physical shape and they had even been used in mental health clinics in an experimental fashion. Nisul wanted to see if she could break through and find the answers to life. Or maybe if she held the broken protractor as she cast the spell, she would connect with Earth somewhere out there in the multiverse. Scully, this is hard to talk about, because this was also a common suicide or excarnation method. She tells herself that is not what it was, Scully. She never lost full consciousness, but she remembers being thrust out of her body and entering a place where maybe something told her Earth was definitely not real. And there was definitely not pure cause. And then she remembers breathing, 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 with Rhian and Lyra near her while she just wanted her perception to return to normal. What really happened? Scully, Nassau doesn't know. With my powers, we could know. But if we are to know her, we have to, well, not know, along with her. Nassau came back to the street and the present moment. She stood up from the park bench she had been sitting on and headed out toward the main path of the Harmony District, towards Chancel. Chancel was a neighbourhood that in more remote times had been part of the Church of Oneness. When the mechs crashed on Horaith, the Onenessites had been among the first to welcome them. The church had been open to all sentience and was a major part of the reconciliation of the races after the Great Entropy. Religion had a complex relationship with sentient rights and social justice. On Chancel Avenue was the Orange Lantern, a guild hall open to artists and gamers. As her hands went in her pockets and her pace quickened, Nissel said she was going to go there to write, but knew she might get caught up in a game. She pondered to herself, what is really the difference between one of her writing sessions and a game session? Well, if there were other players involved, then yes, the difference was obvious. But even in single player, the rules of the predictive meta system would play things out via the system intelligence or SI. By 4i, the system could generate dialogue on the immersion scrolls. 
she could have a conversation unscripted with NPCs or characters she made, to a degree. Nissal had tried to input into the meta scroll a scenario in which an avatar of her actual being was speaking to her characters, and she told the system to grant them fourth wall awareness. It played along only so much. She had tried this more with her character Ethan from 4i than later with Owain from 5i. So, you are saying you are a being from another world? asked Ethan. Yes, in a sense, I am you. I am speaking to you through sort of a living story, said Nissal. My word! It is as if we are peering behind the veil of God's creation, said Ethan. Yes, now I would like you to imagine a world where magic is real, but one was seeking a purely causal reality. How would you do it? asked Nissal. At this point, the system broke down, and the rules of the immersion scroll could go no further in this simulated discourse. The blue text of the DM auto narration appeared on the scroll. Professor Ethan Rhys Davis looks at his watch and stands up from the park bench you and he are sitting on. No, you stupid scroll! I am not on the park bench. I am in the real world, Nissal had cursed. But the truth was, she was not truly talking to anyone. And the system could only go a few turns, simulating, by chance or by wishful interpretation of the player, something that could be read as fourth wall awareness in her characters. And wasn't Nissal, by turn of indulging this, risking a foray into her own prior delusion? I can identify with reality not being so real, Scully. Thanks, little buddy. I appreciate you taking this part seriously. I really do. She entered the Orange Lantern. It was a former guild hall and at one point a lecture hall for theoretical magecraft, after it had been the chancel for the Church of the One. The psychic impression of those days, mixed with the energies the wood and stone of the place also recorded from years of past and present academia and learning, as well as arts and gaming. This was one of her favourite places in the city. If she needed to define such as a specific space and not a section of the city. Everything was wood and stone and spacious and warm and it was full of light and shadow in just the right places. The tables and booths and long flat gathering round tables were lit, as were the pathways through the place, but the corners were soft and shadowed, like the old wood was a blanket. The meta impression from the history made one feel learning, wonder, safety and welcomeness. As she wrote, Nissel ordered a little food, a cool tea, and a small shot of spirits. She was pleased in hitting the goals she had set out for herself. One, she nursed her food and drink slowly. And two, she managed to write out more background framing for Owain. I am going to sit. I'm going to put you on that rock there. No, not the duck-shaped one. The one that's shaped like a, well, not a duck. She had written enough for today. She could game now. Who was here? Flag was here. Flag's real name was... She couldn't quite remember. He was always fun to roleplay with table style. No fancy immersion scrolls. Nissel wavered on preferring Earth game in tabletop or immersion scroll. But Flag's style always made tabletop fun, except where he inserted his sociopolitics which were a partial but not complete match for her own. Bundling up her items into her pack, Nissal casually walked over to Flag's table. Hey, Flag! Flag greeted her with a slight smile, a warmth he extended to only a scant few. Noting Nissal's softly awkward waiting for an invitation stance, he motioned her to sit with a brusque hand gesture. Nissal gently placed down her things on the cushioned bench and slid into her seat directly across from Flag. It had roughly been one week, maybe two since she last spoke with him. 
Nassau, at best, would chat with him here and there, and, at worst, end up not working anymore. But if Flagg was writing campaigns, he was done playing for the night, so she would at least not end up playing until three in the morning and wake up late the next day with no work done. What are you working on? Flagg glanced up from the parchment in front of him when she spoke, absently grabbing his ornate tankard to take a long sip of orchid wine with his artificial hand. Campaigns, mostly. How about you, traitor? He smirked, ribbing Nissal about her recent employment at the Athens Guild. Flagg had been the first person Nissal gushed to on Meta immediately after her meeting with Tuadon. As he placed the tankard down, Nissal watched as the glyphs around Flagg's false hand flickered, giving the metal an iridescent sheen. Flagg had lost the hand years ago doing a factory job. Since then, it had been replaced by a mech donor hand, inlaid with control glyphs connected to his consciousness, giving it what some would call an ethereal glow. When he first got the implant, Flagg used to use a clumsy glamour to try to make the prosthetic look more natural, but quickly decided his new hand was perfect as it was, and now showed it off with pride. Nassau didn't understand how anyone would look unfavourably on it, it was fantastic. Yet, people did. Just brainstorming a few ideas for the Five Eye panel. Nissal struggled to keep from giggling with delight. I usually don't see you out during rain. You here for LGR? Nissal pulled a few bits of parchment out of her pack. Look, I like LGR, but I'm here because I needed time off. I worked myself to a literal diagnosed exhaustion on a cargo run a few weeks back. I've seen some of the LGR precursor events, but I won't try and earn myself some fake good citizen points by saying that's what I'm here for, said Flag. Flag watched Nissal shrink back into her seat and silently cursed himself for being an ass and attempted to change the subject. Notice anything? He asked. He was clearly referring to the environment in the Orange Lantern and would only be doing so if he had done some kind of job for them since the last time he and Nissal encountered each other here. Nissal glanced around awkwardly. The... tile work? She asked, almost sure she was wrong. The wood, he said, blinking at her slowly. I redid all the wood finish by hand. They don't even have an ambiance glamour on them. Flag straightened his posture, quite pleased with his expert-level work. Doesn't the ambiance glamour on the stone carry over to the wood? She asked. Well, yeah, of course, to some degree. Here's where you say, nice work on the wood finish, Flag," he said, feigning exasperation. Nice work on the wood finish, Flag," she parroted. Flag offered her a pointed glare common to old friends. So, how is Tuadon Appalach in person? He asked. He's all right, she said, her giddy mood returning. He's very direct. Not a small talk guy. Unless that reporter, friend, associate, frissociate, that guy reporter who makes him small talk. He seems very formal said Flag, barely able to hide his displeasure. In interviews, I would describe it as working very hard to seem relaxed. It's like he's expending great effort to keep his face muscles loose when he talks, said Nassau. So, what is the big campaign you're going to do at the convention? He asked. Five I, she said. Yes he said sarcastically. I had gotten that far. I guess you can't say much. I can't say much because it's a work in progress. And even if it wasn't, I couldn't say much about it. Flag raised his hands in surrender. Okay, then tell me what you can. I promise not to dig my nose in. Nissel smiled and found herself recounting recent happenings to him. The plan to network with people at LGR, leading to the gig with Tuadon. The work on the campaign, and the recent trip with Lyra to Drothla. 
that she actually did have news worth catching up on. Wait, I thought I told you when she went back to Jorothla? Okay, sure, normally when you ask questions. Scully, I get to it when I get to it, but sure. Let me tell you about her trip there.